Hey friends, we are looking at some suffix, suffixes today, able and ibble. And remember, a suffix is a part of a word added to the end of a base word, and it changes the meaning of the word. So for example, the suffix is able and ibble that we're talking about today, change a verb into an adjective. And these endings are used to mean able to be or capable of. So for example, if we look at the word agreeable, the root word or the base word for that would be agree. That's a verb that means uh, you would uh, go along with something. You have the same opinion. But when we add agreeable, it changes it to mean capable of agreeing. So for example, the teacher was agreeable to the student's request to change the quiz to the following day. So we have the same thing with remarkable. The base word would be remark, is, which is a verb. And then remarkable would change it to an adjective. So remarkable used in a sentence could be, it is remarkable how quickly his broken arm healed. Next we have adaptable. The base word would be adapt. And then it changes to adaptable. Like is the verb that's the base word in likable. And then over here we have reversible. So the base word for that would be reverse, which is to go backwards. And reversible is able to go backwards or able to undo something. Next is audible. The root word for that would be audio, like something you hear. And audible is something you can hear. It's describing it. Visible, the root word would be vision. And then flexible adds able to the root word flex. Now just to review, we have some prefixes that we have talked about previously. Sub, remember that means under or beneath, and some examples of that would be subject, submit. One of our critical vocabulary words was subdue. And we also have the word for, which means before, like foreshadow or foretell. Those things are foreshadow, something is coming, foretell, like you can foretell the future, tell it before it happens. So before we continue our Perseus and the Fall of Medusa drama that we have been reading, let's talk about some figurative language. We have talked about this with other stories before, but on this one, what I really want us to focus on, there's a few different types of figurative language in this story. And one thing that I want us to be looking for is a simile, which it gives us an example of that on this anchor chart right here. And that's comparing two different things using the words like or as. So for example, the goddess floated in the air like a cloud. It has that word like in there, so we know it's a simile. Something else that isn't really on this chart, but it could be considered sensory language, is sometimes an author will use imagery or words that create images in the reader's mind to make the reader feel a certain emotion or have a really vivid picture of what's happening in their mind based on what's happening in the text. So for example, the king's eyes narrowed and his lips curled into a snarl as the hero entered the room. That's giving me the image in my mind of his eyes, which are getting smaller, they're narrowing, his lips curl into a snarl that's telling me he's not happy to see this person. Something else that an author may include, and it's not on this chart specifically, but it is called an illusion, not with an I, with an A. Illusion talks about a person or a place or a thing from another text that's usually pretty well known from a piece of literature or maybe from history, and authors will make allusions to Greek myths a lot because they are so well known. And authors can make comparisons to those allusions, and that helps the reader understand what they are describing. So, for example, the man was as strong as Hercules. The story of Hercules is a really well-known Greek myth, and so that's telling us just how strong this man is. So we are going to practice finding some of these examples of figurative language in Perseus and the Fall of Medusa. And the first page we're going to start on 
is page 280 and 281. And first, let's look at section 22. And Hermes is the one speaking. And the stage direction says, Handing Perseus sandals with wings. Take my winged slippers. They will fly you away from all harm. So that winged slippers, that's helping me imagine his escape. It's not just any slippers. They have wings on them. And then when I come over to line 29, Perseus is speaking. Perhaps, I, but I wear winged slippers that will carry me to the god Zephyr. He will carry me on his soft winds back to my home. So that's imagine, helping me imagine this escape even more. His winged slippers that we just read about and on the soft winds, it's, it's happening very easily and very gently. And that helps me know just exactly what Perseus's escape was like. Now I also want us to look down here once we get into scene two, and there is a stage direction that includes a simile. I want you to take just a second to look at some of these stage directions. Remember, they're in parentheses, and figure out which one includes a simile. Remember, a simile is comparing two different things using the words like or as. So down here at section 35, a breeze moves her hair softly as a whisper which stirs feelings of love from Perseus. So there the simile is her hair, a breeze moves her hair as softly as a whisper. So that helps me imagine just how gentle this breeze is. It's very calming, it's barely moving it. So the breeze is kind of compared to a whisper. And the last thing we are going to look at is on page 284, where Polydectes is speaking. And he says, Very well, go fetch her. I take it you did not succeed on your odyssey. I knew you to be a failure from the minute I met you. You know now that I will have to banish you from my kingdom, or worse. Now, that word odyssey is one of our vocabulary words with this text, but it is also, like I was mentioning earlier with the figurative language, it's also an allusion to a really famous, well-known Greek poem that follows the journey of a hero. So if, it, if Polydectes is saying you did not succeed on your odyssey, he's saying you, you didn't succeed on your hero's journey, but we know that, that is not the case in this allusion that Polydectes was making. He didn't exactly have the right idea. So I hope all of these things help you better understand this story. There is a lot of information, a lot of Greek mythology in this story, and I hope this makes it a little easier to understand.